so now we have uh, uh, Diogo Monica, who's uh, uh, in our security team, and he's going to tell you about uh, how, uh, uh, how we do security in orchestration. Thank you very much. My name is Diogo, as, as was announced. I am not the security team. <laughs> I am part of the security team. Security team actually has a bunch of people that are way smarter than me. So today, I would like to talk about orchestrating least privilege. And by the way, Justin, that was an amazing talk. Thank you so much. Um, orchestrators is something that is essentially something that we're talking about a lot these days. And with the announcement of swarm mode and orchestration built in into Docker, something that is really relevant. So today I really wanted to talk about orchestrating least privilege, which is something that our team has been thinking a lot about. Now before I talk about orchestrating least privilege, I should probably define what is an orchestrator and what is least privilege. And so now the question becomes, what is an orchestrator, right? But before I can define what is an orchestrator, I really need to define what is an orchestra? So an orchestra is essentially a group of musicians that essentially has to play together with different roles and has to have this cohesive music, so play in synchronicity. The interesting thing about these kinds of arts, such as, um, such as symphonies or ballets or, for example, plays, is that they all follow a script. There's a composer or an artist that creates some kind of music and then there is essentially a conductor that conducts this music and has a few musicians uh, play, it, play it out. And even though there are directors and conductors of these musics, they have limited leeway as to what they can do. The leeway that they have is really around certain aspects of how the music is done, like the tempo. They really can't change the music sheet itself. And in classic music, we have this music sheet and they can't change the notes in particular. If you go to, for example, a play, they can change the casting and they can change the set. But one thing that can, can change is essentially the wording. And in the example of a ballet, they actually can change the actors or, in this case, the dancers, but they can't really change the movements. Those have to be followed. So one thing that is really interesting that is common across all of these three, symphonies, plays, and ballets, is that there is a declarative syntax that the authors actually define their intentions, and those intentions are followed. For the case of an orchestra, there's obviously the music sheet that is made by the composer. For the example of a play, there is essentially um, a script that has to be followed with everything that has to be said back and forth, and in ballet, it turns out that there's actually something called ballet notation that I learned about a few days ago that looks something like this, which is actually magnificent. And so there's this specific typed script that has to be followed. And so if you continue with our analogy and to come back to what an orchestrator actually is, imagine in the case of an orchestra, we have a composer such as Bach, and Bach is going to write this music sheet. And this music sheet is going to essentially be used by a composer or a conductor that is then going to instruct the musicians to actually follow this music with a certain tempo. And if we bring it back to computer science, we actually have the exact same thing. In our orchestrators, we have an engineer that is going to essentially have a, def a defined type with a specific language, and it's going to instruct an orchestrator to do a bunch of actions in a set of notes. So in the case of a conductor, the job of a conductor really is casting who's going to play, assigning the sheet music to different players. It's going to unify the performers because this has to be a very good unified performance. And it's obviously going to set the tempo of the actual orchestra. For our orchestrators, we are going to do node management. We are definitely going to do task assignment across all the nodes. We're going to have to keep reconciling the cluster state as it varies across time. And we're going to do resource management delivery and removal of resources. So now that we know what an orchestrator is, we come back to the question, what is a least privileged orchestrator? And to define a least privileged orchestrator, I first have to define what is, what is least privileged. And so going back to our orchestra analogy, least privilege is essentially specialization. This particular tuba player can't play drums. It has a sheet music for the tuba and it only has access to the tuba. 
It should not have access to the sheet music for the drums or the drums themselves. And so this strict access can also be applied to computer science. But in computer science, we call this the principle of least privilege, where, and I quote the definition, a process must be able to access only the information and resources that are necessary for its legitimate purpose. No more, no less. So now that we know what is orchestrating least orchestrators and least privilege, why do we actually need least privilege in the first place? Well, it, it turns out that it, it really comes down to the attacker model that you're trying to tackle in your orchestrator or in your distributed system. Following least privilege actually allows us to think critically about all components of the system and essentially go towards the most adversarial attacker model that we can think. And so in those situations, have some resistance or at least only give up and only allow compromise of the resources that we have. A little bit like Justin talked about different keys and the compromise of a root key should not compromise the whole system. And so there are five broad categories of attacker models that I'd like to go over today and that I think are interesting for this particular talk. The first one is an external attacker. In our symphony example, an external attacker can essentially be seen as someone in the audience throwing a tomato to one of our musicians because the musicians have screwed up a note, right? And, and by the way, an aside, I spent two hours of my existence trying to find a picture of a monkey throwing a tomato online, and I, for the life of me, I cannot find one. So there's no monkeys throwing tomatoes on the internet. <laughs> Somebody please go out and create one because I need it for my slides. So in this case, if we turn it into actual orchestrators and computer systems, what this is equivalent is an external attacker outside of your firewall. So you have your cluster behind your firewall, and you have an external attacker somewhere on the internet that is essentially is trying to compromise your infrastructure. What is interesting about this is that this is easily bypassed if somebody is an internal attacker. And so we have the internal attacker model, which is represented by a dog messing with your sound system very fitting for an orchestra. And so in the in internal model, an internal attacker, you effectively have access to the switch as the attacker. You don't own the switch, but you have access to essentially send packets and communicate with nodes. The next step in terms of attacker model is going to be what I call the NSA cat. The NSA cat is essentially a cat that can listen to all of your communications that are going in the network, and it can essentially have active attacks. And in computer science, this would be equivalent to having a cluster with the managers, in our case of a swarm, for example, that are represented by the M's, and having a few workers at the bottom, and all communications are effectively compromised because there is the NSA cat in the middle of every single one of them. If we go further in our attacker model, we're going to have what I call the malicious musician. The malicious musician is effectively a worker node, one of the nodes of your cluster. And in computer science, it would look something like this, where a worker node is now malicious and is effectively adversarial. So whatever resources this worker node has access to, they effectively are owned by the attacker too. And finally, we have the most malicious attack of all, which is a malicious conductor, right? A very adversarial model where the conductor effectively does whatever it wants. This can also be seen as a malicious manager. A malicious manager is essentially an attack where the manager that controls your whole orchestrator and your system actually has access to your resources. The interesting thing about this particular attacker model is that it is a little bit of the worst case scenario. If this manager gets compromised, it effectively has access to a lot of resources on the host. But if we're following at least privilege in this particular situation, note that the only thing that the manager should do in an ideal orchestrator that follows this privilege is do an eclipse attack on the worker nodes that are depending on it. It should not be able to take leadership of the cluster. It should not be able to influence any other nodes. It should not be able to tell the worker node what to run, what not to run, what access the node has resources. It should only have access to the workers that are connecting to it and for which it is responsible. So this is really important. And so now that I've motivated why we actually need this privilege, this attacker model where even a compromise of a manager that is part of your raft cluster can't really affect the network or the cluster in a way that is unbounded privilege, how do we actually get there and how do we achieve it? So we came up with, by thinking about these attacker models, with some design principles 
that kind of like showcase our idealized least privileged infrastructure. And so we're going to go attacker model by attacker model and showcasing a few things that are actually important to mitigate against them. The first one, we go to the tomato case, mitigating an external attacker. So for this, I think the first one that is really important and something that it is done today, but it should be done, is that access to external ports or externally accessible ports should be explicit and it should be turned off by default. What this means is if you run a service, unless you tell it to explicitly expose itself, it should not be exposed. And so somebody randomly off the internet can connect to it, period. The second thing that is interesting is that every single administrator endpoint or access that is more than just a port should be authenticated and authorized by default. Such that a misconfiguration or somebody puts it online, it doesn't really give any other privilege to the attacker from day one by default. So this really takes care of our external attacker. If we go now to the internal attacker, we need a little bit more. We need both authentication on the network and the cluster control plane communication. What I mean by this is imagine that you have a gossip in your network. If somebody connects to your switch, it should not be able to participate in this gossip. And if somebody connects to your switch, it should not be able to send random communication to either your managers or your workers. It should not be able to do anything. Nobody should accept a packet from somebody connected to the switch unless they've been proven to be authenticated and part of the cluster. And this is something that is really hard to do, and usually people put themselves behind of the firewall, and we have what the phenomena is, which is the hard shell with the gooey soft inside. If you keep escalating this, and we go to our NSA cat, we effectively want to have every single piece of data of the control plane and of the data plane that is encrypted. And not only encrypted, it should obviously be authenticated, or it sh there should be integrity guarantees, such that a man in the middle that is active can't do replay attacks, et cetera, et cetera. Keep escalating, going to a malicious worker. So now somebody compromised your actual node. Well, now things become a lot more complicated, right? Th the problem just became hairy. But the first thing that you should do is that workers should only have access to resources that they strictly need access to. And specifically, if you think of configurations, if you think of networks, if you think of secrets, a worker should not be able to request secrets or configurations for anything else except what the orchestrator and what the manager actually gave it to run. So this is an important guarantee and is essentially following the least privilege with every single resource that your worker has access to. The second thing is that we need to think about a push versus pull model in this particular case. And what I mean by this is independent what is the path of communication, what I care about is when a worker is sent something to run the manager decides what resources it should be running with. And the worker should not have a privileged access to kind of query the manager and say, give me this resource. For a simple reason, which is a simple interface like this is a lot less prone to problems around ACLs and around escalation and access to resources that the worker shouldn't have to access to. So it simplifies the system a lot. You run this bundle with every single resource that you need. If you don't have the resource, then you can't run it, period. And you can't request it. We also should not have the ability of any worker to modify any state of the cluster whatsoever except its own. And even the state that it changes in its own should be state that should not be trusted by the manager to make decisions around orchestration that you care about. For example, it is totally okay if a worker says that it now has twice as much memory because you're gonna make that decision to do orchestration and put more containers. But if you have some kind of a privileged network or if you have a set of nodes that are special, that are pets, that are running a hardware security module, all of a sudden a node should not be saying, I now have a hardware security module, please schedule things that are running credit card payments. So we, I can essentially gather all these containers or all of these tasks that are really important. So that should not be able to happen. And finally, the identity of a worker should always be assigned and never requested. So a worker should not be able to say, oh, I'm joining the system with ID A. It should always be, I'm joining the system, who am I? And that ID should be consistent across the lifetime of the worker in the cluster, and we're gonna see a demo of something similar to that. And finally, we get to the malicious, malicious manager, right? At this point, we've seen compromise of everything, and now we're in the situation where we can't trust the person or the entity in this case that is sending us the actual tasks. So in this case, the first thing that we need to realize is that there has to be decoupling of the work that is sent down by a manager to a worker and the authorization around the worker verifying if this workload should be ran. 
Effectively, what I'm saying is that arbitrary code should not be run on workers that comes from managers. An easy way of doing this is actually using Notary. So Docker Content Trust, or a higher level plane that tells us that someone from the outside, a user, an engineer, must have signed this content for this content to be valid for me to run. So if I do a Docker run, that is going to implicitly do a Docker pull, and that Docker pull should ver be verifying the signature of this actual content. And that signature has to be signed by a user, no manager in our cluster has access to these keys. The second thing is that key material, if you're distributing secrets and configs, why would the manager have access to this? If we're designing a least privileged model, then the manager should have access to no such thing. And so we either encrypt secrets directly to the nodes, or we have to find a third-party way of retrieving secrets that is separate from the main communication mode. There should also no, not be the ability of a worker node or a manager node independently spinning up new containers or new nodes. And the reason for that is if a manager can spin up new nodes, effectively means that a manager can fake new identities and add new nodes to the system and essentially schedule these containers and these tasks in those systems. At a limit, a manager can say, please schedule work on my node and then retrieve from memory all the secrets and all the configs. And we can't allow this to happen. And so this requires effectively a system that is probably a third party mechanism, such as an external CA that is actually minting new nodes that come into the network and that come into the cluster and not simply allowing the manager to do whatever it wants. And finally, I think it's obvious, but no manager should be able to control or have access to or read service to service communication. So it should not be part of a proxy that is proxying all traffic. And if it is, it should be encrypted. And now, I would really like to do one step ahead and talk about something that bothers me a little bit. So it's a mini Diogo rant and that I would like to go over right now. In 2013, about um, Diego and John wrote a paper that we're all familiar with, um, the Raft protocol. And the Raft protocol was fantastic. Essentially, it, through decomposition and space reduction, simplified a lot the implementation and distributed systems. And we've seen a boom of consensus protocols or people using consensus protocols, mostly thanks to them. However, the problem of Raft is that it was not designed to be Byzantine uh, tolerant, right? It, it does operate in a fail-stop scenario. So we effectively continue building distributed systems, and we're now building on top of a primitive that is not as good as it could be. And even though I understand that Byzantine fault tolerance has a lot of problems with scalability, there are some practical implementations, and there's Sangaroa and Juno and other mechanisms that are actually trying to do Byzantine fault tolerance and Raft, and that we should start as a community looking to, and we should start actually getting some operational experience with, because this is going to allow us to do the final step, which is resisting a manager and making sure that a manager can't take leadership of the cluster. Right now in Raft, any person participating in Raft can essentially create um, a new, can trigger a new election, and it can trigger new elections forever, or trigger a new election until, until it becomes a leader, and then when it becomes a leader, essentially effectively has control over the whole cluster. So effectively with this, and with all these attacker models and these issues, what is the current state of orchestrators? Well, the current state of orchestrators is effectively a street performer. It's, it's an artist that has access to every single instrument, all the music sheets, has access, is both the conductor and the musician, effectively does everything. And so this is actually very entertaining, and it makes you want to put $5 on the donation bucket of this individual that is playing on the street. But I really don't want to have a street performer running on my production cluster, right? What I actually want is an orchestrator that follows these principles. So I think we deserve better and we want orchestrators that actually live up to the name. So as an interesting segue, let me tell you about something. Let me tell you about Docker Swarm. So in Swarm, we actually did a lot to try to achieve this goal. And we're definitely not there. We're definitely on the path to try to achieve least privilege. And in particular, the way that Swarm operates from the get-go is it simplifies stuff that is really complicated. The first one is CAs. When you start a Swarm node, if it is the first swarm node in the cluster, we automatically create a self-signed certificate authority for you. So the first node comes up, creates a certificate authority, signs itself certificates, adds certificates for a manager because they're the first node, and then all of a sudden you have a full-featured one-node swarm that is a full-featured CA. And when a new node join, wants to join, what you have to do is you have to provide a token, and we're going to talk a little bit about the token in a moment. And once you provide a token, you effectively do this CSR dance to achieve an identity for the newly minted node. 
And what I meant by this CSR dance is there's a private public key pair that is generated on the worker. And the worker only sends public components up. So this already meets some of our least privileged objectives. There's no shared private key material. Once this identity is minted, and once worker has an identity such as identity A, no manager can ever steal that identity from the worker. And the certificate authority can mint a new certificate that has that identity, but effectively that identity becomes, that public key becomes associated with that worker node and can't be faked. And all managers and workers will have their own identities that are cryptographically signed, cryptographically signed node identities that are the same across the lifetime of this node and this cluster. Moreover, we actually have certificates that have what, the, what is the role, so in an orchestra, what is the actual type of instrument that you're playing, we have it, what is the role that you're playing in this cluster. It could be a worker, but it could be a manager. But we don't want that to be fluid in the sense that you can rep auto-report it. You want that to be inside of your identity and attached to who you are. And in this case, it's going to live in the certificate as we're gonna see in the demo. And finally, we want to protect against men and middle attackers and against external attackers. So every single endpoint communication around the control component and control plane of our cluster has mutual TLS and is encrypted and authorized by default. What this means is that no worker can ever fake to be a manager in the cluster and no external person can either connect to any of the endpoints and successfully do a TLS handshake because all TLS handshakes will be verified and will be mutually authenticated. So you have to provide a valid CA signed client certificate that has an OU that matches what is the role in the cluster. If you are a worker and you try to connect to a manager only endpoint, you will be denied. So I mentioned a token. You have to provide a token to join this cluster and get an identity. This is yet another thing that we did that essentially comes secure by default. And so there is an endpoint that is open for new nodes to join, but there is effectively a cryptographic token and a randomly generated secret that you need to prove and you need to send to prove that you have access to the actual um, node and to the actual cluster. And the way that the token works is it actually has two big components that are important. The first component has, in green, a cryptographic hash of the root, no of the root CA. And we do this so it's easy to bootstrap the actual configuration of who you trust. It also has a randomly generated secret that is service side generated and essentially allows you to verify if the person that is or if the node that is trying to join the cluster is authorized or not. And we also added two other things. A version feels self-explanatory and we also added a swarm token which is effectively a prefix that you can search on your version control systems to make sure that you're not leaking uh, tokens on GitHub. So go set up a search for swarm token on your private repositories and make sure that you're not leaking tokens that are important. And if you, will, if you do, there's a rotate command. It's really easy. Please go rotate your tokens right now. So with this token, now we can do the actual certificate CSR dance and we can actually obtain identities. And the way that's done is essentially in three easy steps. The first thing that a worker does when it tries to connect to the manager is it has been handed a token and it has been handed the IP address or the host name of the manager. And with these two things, what's going to do is, first, it's going to download the root CA file. It's going to use the cryptographic hash that we've seen that the token has to make sure that this, hash, that this file is legitimate. With that file, it's going to create a TLS connection to a manager. It's going to use that CA to validate that this is effectively the remote host that it wants to communicate. And it's going to submit a CSR that only contains public information to the manager such that a new certificate can be signed from it. Once the certificate is signed, it's going to download the certificate, and now it has an identity, uh, an identity that it has been handed to it by the manager that it can now use for mutual TLS and to register and then do session communication and register a session and participate in the cluster. What about certificate rotation, which is essentially the bane of our existence as, um, as ops people. You've had a certificate expire in your hands for sure. So certificate rotation becomes easier. What we do is, we generate a totally new key pair, new public key, new private key, and then we use the old key pair that we have to essentially request that this new key pair is signed. And we do this consecutively, over and over again, across time. So if a key was leaked, the key will no longer be valid. And if you have rotation that is really short, and in a swarm kit, for example, we allow you to have uh, one hour of rotation. So you can have certificates, all certificates of every single one of your nodes rotating every hour, if you wish so, and all the keys can be leaked, and you have an average of 30 minutes of exposure of this particular key. 
So that's really cool. And essentially has auto rotation and TCP connections don't drop, rotates from under your connections, whether you're a manager or a worker, everything is being rotated. And on the path to least privilege, if a manager has access to the CA, then effectively it can control the identities of the nodes, which I said previously is a bad thing. So we included support for an external CA, such that it could be an external CA that is actually minting these nodes and these identities. And a manager simply forwards the CSRs and has them being minted, and has them being assigned. So now I would like to actually give you a demo of um, SwarmKit with joining, creating a small cluster, and doing rotation of certificates. So I'm going to have to mirror. I'm going to have to mirror my hosts. How do I do this? There we go. Mirror displays. You can put it back up. Okay. We are game. Okay, so I'm going to increase the size of this. The first thing that we're going to do is if we're creating, by the way, this is a modified version of SwarmKit. The only thing that this modified version of SwarmKit has is <laughs> every five seconds it generates a new certificate instead of uh, using a user configured option. As I told you, one hour is the minimum. We really don't want people to shoot themselves in the foot. And so one hour is the minimum. But for me, I put myself five seconds because it's a lot cooler instead of you waiting an hour until the next rotation. OK, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a node. And this node is going to be obviously a manager. And the moment I click this, what effectively is happening is automatically a certificate authority got created, self-signed authority, certificates got generated for this manager, and essentially the manager is up and running. A particular detail that I would like to point out is every five seconds, you're going to see something appearing on the screen. And that is obviously the manager rotating the certificate every five seconds, as I told you it would. Second thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to do inspect to the cluster to obtain the token. And now that I have this token, I can effectively join a new node to the cluster. So I paste the token in. This is a swarm token join. It effectively says join this cluster at this, uh, this swarm at this IP address using this token. Once I click Enter, we see that it actually has joined. And the detail is going to be the same thing. Every five seconds, certificate of the agent or the worker is going to be rotated. OK, so I can actually prove to you that this is working and that we have two nodes in the system by doing a node LS. And so we have two nodes in this system, and they're working just fine. But more interestingly, what I actually want to show you is this. I'm going to do a watch on the certificate of node 2. So this is essentially effectively doing a watch on the certificate on disk for node 2. And what you're going to see is I added a diff option. The diff option essentially shows you in white everything that changes. Every, every time that there's an update. So every five seconds, you're going to see something change on that certificate. And the interesting thing is that the things that change are obviously the public key, because I told you, new, private, public key, key pairs. The things that don't change are the role and the ID of this node. For the lifetime of this node, doesn't matter what happens to the node, it will have this ID, and it will have this particular, or for now, it will have this particular role. And this ID will not change whatever we do to the node unless we remove completely and we rejoin it as a new node. And so this is pretty interesting. So now what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to do the following. I'm going to do node ls. So I'm going to see again what the nodes are running. And this node is our worker node, not our manager. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to promote this node to be a manager by doing node promote. When I do node promote, immediately the OU now becomes Swarm Manager. So the certificate changes to actually reflect the new level of permission. So we just promoted this particular node from a tuba player to a drums player. But note that the CN is still the same. Therefore, the node identity remains the same. And obviously, I can do the opposite. And I can just go here and demote the node. And it will back, we'll be back to a worker immediately. So now, you're back to being a tuba player, because apparently, you really suck at drums. So every five seconds, rotating certificates, both managers and uh, workers from under the TCP connections, no connections are dropped, and effectively meaning that all the key material that was used before is no longer valid. So going back to our presentation, the current state that we have in swarm mode and in Docker is what we can be described as um, a jazz band, right? We are in sync 
playing a song, but effectively we are self-organized, self-managed. What we want to go to is we want to go to a model where we no not only resist malicious musicians, which we do right now, but we also want to resist malicious conductors. So we want to go from a jazz band to essentially a full-on classical opera. And for that, we would love your help. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? There's a question right there. I'm not sure if we have mics. Yeah, again, uh, could you maybe explain uh, under which circumstances the token could be compromised? Because this is the interesting point. Yeah, so the token is compromised if um, you tweet it, if you <laughs> committed it to GitHub, uh, if you paste it on a Slack channel, happens all the time to us. Um, effectively, those are the options, right? You intentionally leaked it. The, um, imagine that you have a configuration file where you put your token, or imagine that you put your token in some kind of like system and that leaked to a log. Whatever it happens, you should, you should effectively rotate it. It's such an easy operation for you that you should absolutely do it if that yeah, happens. Yeah, but it's probably uh, sufficient to get only part of the token, right? Well, uh, it was a bit fast before. Um, so the only part of the token that is secret is actually the last part, but you should not look at the token as a composable entity. You should be looking at the token as its actual unit. So there's no such thing as part of the token. You have the token, if the token is leaked, you should rotate or people can, or other nodes can actually join your system. And there are two tokens, there's actually a manager token and a worker token, but effectively what you should be using is there's one token to join the system, and then you can promote or demote nodes from managers to workers. Does that make sense? Perfect. This question over there at the end. Why are they rotated every hour? Okay, so the question is, why are they not rotated every hour? So it turns out that there's a lot of systems that depend on something that is really annoying, really, really annoying, and that something is time. Systems like TLS depend on clocks being in sync. And so it seems like it's a reasonable requirement to have clocks that are in sync, um, but it turns out in production, it, not so much. And there's a lot of people that have clock syncs. So what we did is uh, we allow you to choose uh, to tell the system that you run a really tightly knit ship and that you have your NTP synced over TLS and you have drifts that are no higher than a couple of seconds, but the reality is that that is not true for the majority of systems. Also, from a perspective of um, maintenance, if something goes wrong and your certificates expire all in one hour, you don't have a lot of time to recover the system and every single node will start dropping out one by one until you have zero nodes in the cluster. And so by actually having three months as a default, we actually allow us to have some leeway. And if you find some problem, something is not being rotated, your managers went down and you didn't notice, so there's no CA to actually renew the certificates, and you actually have three months on average, a month and a half, to solve it instead of actually only having an average of 30 minutes. So if I was ops person and I was sleeping at night, I would be more on the month uh, side of rotation period than on the hour side of rotation period. But that's a great question and effectively what our objective is is to have confidence and operational confidence on our own architecture at Docker and our own installation and infrastructure to come down as low as possible. Maybe two every 12 hours or 24 hours is a very reasonable time period. Five seconds is amazing for demos. Do not use it in production. Other questions? No? Tomorrow there's going to be a uh, bird of feather sessions. We're going to talk about least privilege orchestration. We're going to talk about all of these uh, features, all of these characteristics, and where we're trying to go with this. We would love if you participated. Thank you very much. Thank you.